First up, uh, we, we're going to uh, provide a statement, and Commissioner Fisher is going to read that statement into the record. Yeah, I want to thank my colleagues. I shared a story when, at policy session on Tuesday about being down in California taking care of my grandchildren. And while I had the honor and privilege of reading stories to my little three-year-old Augie, who actually read to me Green Eggs and Ham, and then I read to him, Are You My Mother?, and right before I was tucking him in, he says, I want to see my mama. And I looked down. Now, granted, at the time, I was taking care of my grandchildren because it was a, quite a chaotic scene at their house. They actually turned their house into a movie set, of which my daughter was on the set at the time. But instead of explaining that to little Augie, I uh, just said, of course. And I got up. I left the room. I went to the movie set the movie filming, and I whispered to her, I said, Augie wants to see you, and she stopped everything. She went in the room, and she tucked him in. Just, you know, miles away at the border, there was a different story happening where children didn't have the ability to have their parents because they were being separated from parents due to our federal policy on immigration. And I uh, was really overwhelmed with, with those two competing issues, and I really didn't know what, what we could do, and I was really struggling with that, and I brought that to my commissioners who shared my concern, and one thing, you know, we are one commission here. Um, Helen Keller had a quote once that I like to repeat. It says, I am one, still I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. So we... Um, worked with our equity, diversity, inclusion with Emmett Wheat, Wheat Hall, who's Wheatfield. here? Wheatfield, who's here? And we have a statement that we would like to read into the record. We, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council of Clackamas County, Clackamas County Administration, and Clackamas County Board of Commissioners stand in solidarity with the international community to denounce the inhumane and un-American treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers who seek refuge, freedom, and fundamental human rights in the United States. We further denounce the immoral and unjust treatment of children and families through forced separation and incarceration. We believe families matter. In light of his executive order reversing the forced separation of children from their parents we call upon President Donald J. Trump and his administration to cease and desist from the unconscionable treatment of children as criminals and immediately reunify affected families. We believe all men, women, and children are created equal and deserve dignity. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, we... We had a really interesting conversation that um, um, Commissioner Fisher referred to, and um, I've been struggling amongst all the reading I've been doing on, on all the transportation committees is to find the, this week and, and Monday as well, to find the time to actually explore deeper into this one thing that had come up. And I think I mentioned on Tuesday, um, you know, reading stories back during the war about uh, parents having to put their kids on the ships to, in, to head to the U.S. For, for, their, for their safety, but the parents staying home. And I thought, I wonder how that's happening today. And I kind of referenced that. So I found an article um, late last night when I was um, taking a break. And I'm just going to read one. This is, this is something that was published June 1st of this year um, by PBSO NewsHour. And I'm just gonna, it's several pages. I'm just going to read one paragraph just to give it people the, an idea of the problem or challenge that we're facing. The U.S. has seen some, now this is about unaccompanied children, and this is really what it falls into, there's a name. So if, you have a, if a child is, is separated or is, is moved to the border and their parents, you know, are not accompanied with them, they just show up at the border just as, as children. That's called unaccompanied. So this is what this article is about, unaccompanied children arriving at the border. What happens? So uh, in part of this, the, the paragraph goes as such. The U.S. has seen some surges of children at the border in recent years, most notably in 2014, when the government apprehended 47,000 unaccompanied minors in the first five months of the year. That's a huge number. 
The government has not said how many children have been filtered through this system since the Trump administration's recent zero tolerance policy, but overall, Health Human Services said this week that 10,773 migrant children were under the agency's care. Um, and if you think about 47,000 in just the first five months of 2014 and multiply that, that's about over 100,000 per year that show up at the border. Um, watching some of the news articles on TV, further talking about the cost and the cost of, of, of trying to uh, care for a child per day ranges from uh, a couple hundred dollars up to I think 775 on the information I did find per day. And just, just think about that. And, um, and think about, I also try to contrast that to the people in, this, in, our, in our country, in our state, in our county, in our local cities that are sleeping in a car because they don't have a home. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a balance we have to strike. And um, it's, it's certainly um, something that really tugs on the heartstrings of all of us, but from a practical matter, how we cope with it here at home and how we cope with it at the border when these children show up without parents. And just think about the, the task of trying to reunite them or re, or with their parents when we don't even know where they come from and who they are. It's, 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 it's a very sad situation. So very complicated as well, but I wanna, just wanted to share that little tidbit. Martha. Yeah, I just wanna make a comment. I wanna thank Commissioner Fisher and our Diversity Council for moving forward with this. Um, Many of you know my family's of, uh, my mother's family was Italian, and my grandmother was first generation Italian here. However, her mother was an immigrant, and one of my grandmother's early memories was that when her father died as a small child, they placed my Aunt Michalina and my grandmother Principia in a uh, New York City orphanage. And what my grandmother told me was that she remembers how ashamed she was because they shaved her head bald because of lice issues and um, how ashamed she was to be at the table. And uh, I think that that trauma of separation from her mother, her mother finally did remarry, was able to get them out of the orphanage. Uh, but I think that that trauma stayed with her her entire life and I think that's the thing that we really need to worry about most, that this is kind of trauma that can actually mold somebody's uh, lifelong experiences. And I think we're gonna have to be prepared for that. And I'm also very worried that I, I really, I don't even know what the process is going to be, either at the state level or the federal level, how we're going to find who goes to who. Because these kids evidently have been moved all over the United States and my understanding, we don't have some of the younger kids here, but there are teenagers that have been separated in Oregon from their parents. And yeah, this is not who we are as a country. It's true that immigration is a huge issue that we're gonna have to grapple with, but this is not the humane way to, to do it. And um, I just thank you for, for pulling this together for us. Commissioner, I appreciate it. Well, I just wanna add that uh you know, there, there's a difference between unaccompanied children and a removal of children from their parents. Uh, you won't see a six-month-old crawling over the border. Uh, you know, uh, somebody was telling me, I was listening to the radio this morning, and somebody was visiting these sites, and there was a one-year-old and a six-month-old, and uh, one other, uh, about the same age as a one-year-old, and they were both wearing the same shirt. And so the, the concern was when the, he walked through the first time, he, knew, noted, he recognized the one kid. The second time, he wasn't sure what the one kid's name was because they were wearing the exact same shirt. So are they going to get mixed up? I think there's a huge challenge, and I think that... Uh, I, I think back to, I wasn't here when the Japanese were interned, but my father was, and in Milwaukee, uh, they own, uh, the, it used to be called the Celery Gardens, Less you probably remember that. Um, it, uh, and a lot of the Japanese owned that land, and when they left, a lot of people tried to take that land. And this, a lot of citizens in Milwaukee uh, didn't let that happen. And I was very proud of the fact that my father and grandfather fought to make sure that when they came home, 
they got their land back. And uh, that's also true now. Um, uh, immigrants who are not legally here but have lived here a long time are arrested and sent back to Mexico. What happens to their land? What happens to their house and their bank accounts and all that other stuff? That, there's, it is a huge problem and a problem uh, that is not going to be easily resolved. But I think it's imperative that uh, we as county commissioners and as citizens have a moral obligation to address this issue. If we don't, um, you know, it wasn't so different in Nazi Germany, and it wasn't so different when uh, Roosevelt signed that order and the Japanese were taken from their home by the FBI, I believe, and put into internment camps. And I knew, personally knew people who uh, were interned uh, down in uh, Southern Oregon or Northern California. Toodle Lake, I think it was called. Toodle Lake. Yeah. Anyway, Ken. Um, <clears throat> I think most of us can understand the emotional uh, trauma that occurs when children are separated from their parents. And I think that's been spoken to pretty eloquently already. But I just want to point out some of the legal aspects of things. Since I, my career was in law enforcement, I, I lived less than a mile from the Mexican border for 25 years. The fear mongering that I have seen in this country in the last year and a half regarding people coming across the border to me is disgusting. And it's uh, appealing to the worst nature of, of uh, people to fear monger like this. To lock up people for committing a misdemeanor is not something that we normally do in the law enforcement community. We issue a ticket and expect you to show up in court, most of whom do. Crossing the border is nothing more than a misdemeanor. Being in the country without permission is not even a misdemeanor, it is a civil offense. To lock people up for a civil offense is not something that we do in the law enforcement community. We also do not prevent people from seeing their attorneys, as is being done on the border right now. And yet the Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly that any person in the United States of America is entitled to the full due process of law. And it has nothing to do with their status as citizens or not. They are entitled to the full due process under the law. And finally, I would point out that both in American law and in international law, in treaties that we actually wrote ourselves and got others to sign, to seek asylum is not a crime. You come to the border, you declare that you need, are seeking asylum, you report to an, a, a, the closest um, federal authorities to, to make that claim, and then you are entitled to a hearing before the court as to whether or not your claim for asylum is legitimate. Even that process is being abrogated. We used to be the nation who, who was the beacon of, of human rights. And to yesterday, or the day before, we withdrew from the Human Rights Council. What has happened to us? That's all I have to say. <laughs>